This afternoon, I am in Irvine, California, at the University of California, Irvine, speaking with Melody Lemke, who is the Associate Director for Collection Services. Melody, it is our custom to begin these conversations by asking the person with whom I'm speaking a little bit about themselves as a human being. After all, in addition to being law librarians, we are also people on the side, or is it the other way around? <laughs> Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your life, uh, not only perhaps today, but perhaps when you're even younger? Okay. Um, well, we can start younger. Mm -hmm. I grew up in um, southern Indiana, not southern California, and um, lived on a various tenant farms and whatever. And um, uh, the last farm my dad had was uh, my grandfather's farm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think in terms of a basis for work ethic, that's probably where it comes from, having worked on the farm. I always joked that um, there were some days in the summer, I didn't always have a summer job, but I could, I would end up planting strawberries by day, <laughs> maybe tobacco when my dad got home from his full-time job, and then we might put in hay by the light of the moon. And, you know, you just did everything you could in any given day. Mm -hmm. The thing I think of that as a training tool is that you never have enough time to do everything you have to do at a library, mm -hmm. but it helps you focus on what was the most immediate. Mm -hmm. So that that's my background there, and um, I was the oldest of five and was the first from that family ever to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty common that, that you know the baby boom generation, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and in those days, tuition wasn't quite like it has become since. <laughs> well, and I, and I had scholarships, and I was going to a land grant school in Indiana, right? Ah, so you had it, you yeah, had it figured out. <laughs> I did, and and I worked in the dorm kitchens to make my spending money and book money, right? So, um, and then I met my husband there at Purdue, and um, I knew that I was going to go to library school. So, mm -hmm. I had fun doing um, doing the, during my undergrad, but um, you know, in terms of of um, preparing for being a librarian, I didn't think too much of English and history. So I ended up in communications, radio, TV, and film. Uh huh. And so that's what I did as an undergraduate because I knew I just had to meet my math and science requirements to get into grad school. Mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and it's been kind of interesting to know how much that production uh, background and experience really helped later. Yeah. Well, maybe you can critique what I'm up to here. <laughs> I'm, this side of the camera that the viewers don't see, <laughs> not only Pat Keogh, but there's some wires and some other stuff in the camera. But, Oh, technology has changed since that time. Well, it right? certainly has. So, I mean, I when ran... we started off, this camera that they don't see would be the biggest thing in the room. Now it's the smallest. Now they were, and it's a lot smarter than those little ones were. <laughs> they were huge ones, and and they got to the point where I did do some video production with a camera on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. You know, but it was like. Oh, I remember those. Yeah. You see those on the TV news when they shoot the other mm -hmm. another station in the background or yeah, something. But, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, that was nineteen. 69 to 73 yeah. right so, so who's was, counting <laughs> yeah but that was a long time ago so uh -huh. um and it really was um you know an opportunity in the sense that my husband was thinking about law school and didn't really know so i was finishing my library degree while he did lsats and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and then he got accepted out here at Southwestern, so oh yeah, that's We're nearby. That's right why now. we fled. <laughs> no, we didn't flee. We came to California. Of course, we came. I was assuming we were going to go back. Uh huh. But um, you know, it, perhaps you still could. <laughs> well, I my mother is still alive in Southern Indiana. She's uh -huh. ninety two, mm -hmm. and um. You know, she always is, insists, so when am I coming back? And I'm saying, Mother, I've been here 40 years, right? <laughs> well, why don't you tell her about the advantages of not having to go out in the morning and it's, scrape ice off your windshield? Yeah, I mean, and it, right now, Minnesota and whatever is still having 
tons of snow yeah, in the middle of April. Donner right? and Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the same thing. It's, no. it's, it's, it's a colder winter than usual up there in a winter. We were complaining today, walking you back across campus, how cold it was today, right? So California blood, I don't think I could stand the Midwest anymore. But So I always tease my husband, everything that's happened with me and my career and uh, other things was always his fault because we came to California, right? <laughs> if he's a smart husband, he'll agree. <laughs> publicly. That's right. But only publicly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, anyways, and, you know, the, uh, I used to joke that you know, when we were here, we lived here, and we had two kids, um, that they were my AALL babies because I had them while I was on the executive board. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, I distinctly remember that experience uh, since we were on together at the same correct. time. <laughs> that's correct. And and when you invited me to do this, of course, I had to look back and see who else was on the because I remember Jim Patrick and yeah. and I remember the presence. And I mean, Albert Brecht was yeah. the you know, and Lolly Gassaway. They, and I think were, Bob Baring was. In through that era. Well, and, and they were, uh, they were the existing board, and we were at the final banquet at ALL, oh. and Margaret Leary and I and Judy Dime Smith were coming on the board, oh. and they did a costume, uh, like Washington D.C. or you know something of that era of Washington, right? Oh. In costumes and. Um, we did not sit at the head table because Margaret did not want to be in costume. That's right. That was Lala Gassaway's meeting. Yeah. And we were all in, you know, historic, um, yes. colonial era. Yeah, costumes. And the executive director was dressed as a, a general or something. And that was most appropriate. He even had a sword. That was Jepson, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, Bill Jepson. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, yeah. the rest of us were, you know, Regular politician business types or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so that was that was my you know coming on the board and yeah. and I was pregnant with one of those boys then, and um, so that was kind of my introduction. Hmm, interesting, you know, board. But at that point <laughs> in '87, of course, I'd been active for probably ten years already yeah. in the association. Yeah. So, so if you ask me about my life now. Um, uh, it's a, an interesting process to start a library, mm -hmm. and we've been doing That's that right. <laughs> for almost nine years now, but um, my husband's retired, and mm -hmm. um, getting really close, and um, we have two dogs at home. That helps to keep him busy and out of trouble, and um, both of them are on medication twice a day. Oh. Not us yet, but the dogs are, so um, that keeps him busy and out of trouble, and I commute 57 miles. Wow. Because we live in Pasadena. And I told my husband when this job opening was happening, I really wanted to start a library and help start a library. And if I couldn't survive that commute though, he didn't want to move. We love Pasadena, I really didn't want to move. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, well in that case, I'm moving out a couple nights a week. And that's what I do. Oh. I rent I rent a room from a widow lady mm -hmm. who who's uh, does tutoring and things like that and so it's two miles from campus. So you're not on the interstate or one no, of the no, other I, freeways for several no. hours each way. That's right. It yeah. would be several hours. In fact, I do take the train, um, and it's door to door two hours each way. So um, anyway, uh, so. You know, if it gets back to that worth e work ethic, obviously I'm devoted to my job or I wouldn't be doing this, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. Well, you know, I sort of follow up what life is like and I uh, hope uh, driving a car isn't your only uh, interest <laughs> <laughs> or maybe, but no. do you have any particular hobbies or interests? Mm -hmm. um, or other pursuits that occupy time? Well, I'm an avid reader, which helps on the train, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I'd say, one of my biggest hobbies. Um, I also, my husband says I love to go out and play in the garden. It's mm -hmm. kind of my therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but I often just have a shovel or a hoe or something like that. And so I do garden quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, with our water shortages now, the things that I plant have kind of changed over the years. I 
started off with lots and lots of roses, and now I'm at lots and lots of succulents. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I've noticed that in a lot of gardens, and, and gravel around instead of uh, that's right. traditional mulch and mulch, stuff. Mulch, yeah, that's right. So there's, you know, that's been a real uh, change in my gardening approach, mm -hmm. but I've been, you know, almost all the years that I've been in California, we've had a vegetable garden regardless of where we lived. So mm -hmm. um, because... I was downtown LA at the LA County Law Library, there was a community garden there. And if anybody wants to know where that community garden was, all they have to do is look at the Dorothy, excuse me, no, the Disney Hall, Concert Hall, oh. is now on the land that was vacant in 74 when we had a community garden there. So mm -hmm. so gardening is is really been a long-term passion kind yeah. of stuff. That's nice. You mentioned you don't grow roses now. I should learn not to because we, we can still grow them where I live up in Washington I, State. I still have them. <laughs> but I have all these visitors at night, especially, called deer. Mm -hmm. And if I have not sprayed them with the uh, deer repellent, mm -hmm. um, I come out all the flowers and buds are gone. Yeah. It's just now rose season right now. Now they're all just blooming, and so it's my favorite time of year. So. Yeah. Ours aren't quite that far along, but uh, mm -hmm. they'll get there. If, uh, that is the ones where people put deer repelling or fences <laughs> around them. <laughs> well, I get flowers. Yeah. Well, this sort of brings me to ask about something we sort of, you know, we did chat a little bit before this uh, session, and uh, you mentioned that you have a favorite color. Can I ask you what it happens <laughs> to be? I'm wearing it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. I always tell people that I was branded orange in high school, so I've been that color a lot longer than a certain legal publisher, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it's it it gets to the point where people on campus or even the faculty will tease me if I don't have orange on, <laughs> and I and I also said that it was my black, orange is my black, and that always made as a working mother easy to coordinate a wardrobe. If it was orange, it just went together, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I've done that for a long time. Yeah, and well, I think some of us do the same thing with our wardrobes. But in your case, I'm sure it's not for the same reason I do. I, I have no imagination, so I stick to the tried and true that I know it works. <laughs> and, and the orange carries over to the point that um, I have a collection of carrots um, mm -hmm. and <laughs> wall paintings, you know, uh, things of carrots, and um, family and friends, of course, have contributed to that collection. I wasn't all me, um, but you know, even even my binders, my books, my coffee mug, they're orange. So, mm -hmm. so, that's so you weird. have criteria for when you acquire uh, things. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Or they show up on my front porch, or uh, you know. The colleagues go to conferences and I always get the orange stuff. <laughs> so. Now in terms of going back to your uh, your gardening, do you, mm -hmm. can you grow carrots in this climate? Um, you can in raised beds, but um, mm -hmm. many traditional um, vegetables in California become winter crops. Oh. So um, I always love beets. So I'm, all, I, I'm more likely to plant those. They're more a winter, early, early spring crop. Um, Mm -hmm. And, oh, I didn't mention, Patrick, that most of my roses are orange. <laughs> so, you know, I... Somehow that does not surprise <laughs> me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so now you can't grow carrots here. Well, you can't raise bed, and that's really what most people do is oh. raise beds. But um, it's gotten with the water shortage so hard to keep things going and not being able to water as often and stuff like we're um, down to a couple times a week in Pasadena. Yeah. Uh, at certain points, so it, it gets harder to garden. So, well, I know that the whole Southwest uh, desert and, and even out here on the coast is, is short on water. Mm -hmm. I remember things. about two years ago, uh, we had a little family group that went to Las Vegas, mm -hmm. not to gamble, but to look around and drive mm -hmm. elsewhere pretty fast. And I uh, had a family wedding actually, and up in the San Francisco area, mm -hmm. and we then went east by way of the, some of the parks and stuff and ended up there. And I looked, we, we drove the, the, whatever they call it, the, where all the hotels and casinos are, uh -huh. except it's Trump's that's out sort of by itself, but uh -huh. uh, he's there too. And uh, 
that one place, I mean, the tremendous water uh, exhibits. Mm -hmm. Bellagio. Yeah. yeah, with the fountains and mm -hmm. so on. And I'm thinking, you look at Lake Mead nearby, <laughs> where they get their water these days, and it practically looks like it's getting awfully dry. And yeah. I don't know how they long they be, do this. have to be recycling fountains. Um, that Pasadena is just passing an ordinance, ordinance that they have to be recycling yeah. and that kind of thing. So it's a... It's, it, you know, a lot of things were cut back, um, like the Getty Museum. We were out just recently, a group of Lale brands for tea. We went to the Getty, and um, they had just refilled their pool. They had emptied it and everything else, and, and uh, they have a very, very lovely pool. It's part of the garden. And mm -hmm. so even, you know, really, really nice places like that have, have cut back on what they yeah. can do in terms of a water feature or whatever. So. Well, this uh, water display is so immense that I imagine they can't recycle much of that. It must just evaporate off. A lot, that's the problem. A lot yeah. of times it's evaporation. Yeah. Well, sooner or later they may have to rethink that exhibit, <laughs> I guess, but that's above my pay grade to worry that's, about. That's right. Yeah. Speaking of pay grades and mm -hmm. worrying about and so on, can we talk a little bit about your, your career? Sure. Uh, I know you were at Los Angeles County for quite a while, as you've mm -hmm. already alluded. And, then you came here, I guess, attracted by the idea of starting a law school library mm -hmm. and then law school and everything else, basically from scratch. Yeah, it was. It was you exciting. Talk about your career, starting perhaps in the early days. Yeah. Um, well, I mentioned that we came to California because Mike was accepted at Southwestern, and and in '74 I was applying for library jobs, along with hundreds of other people at the same time for CETA grant positions and, oh you know that were mm -hmm. what temporary you know yeah. kinds of things and um so i just started a plan of uh sending unsolicited resumes to everything within uh you know 10 mile 15 mile radius because mm -hmm. we only had one car mike was bite would bike to southwestern where we were living mm -hmm. so i sent an unsolicited resume to la county law library and got hired and i was hired in 74 as a cataloging assistant and, um, you know, which, you know, they had some qualms about hiring a professional to a non-professional position, but mm -hmm. I was just glad to get in the library because I was filing in an insurance company, right? So I, I was, I was thrilled to get a job and, um, you know, to start off at a library of that size, I mean, yeah, that's a pretty major yeah. player in our field, or certainly was in its, in in its that primary era. era. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, certainly it wasn't what it was in the 50s and 60s in terms of budget, because mm -hmm. the filing fees were fluctuating even then, because the LA County Law Library is funded on filing fees. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, but I still had such a range of materials that I was working with. So in terms of training as a cataloger, you mm -hmm. know, it was fabulous. I started there um, just as AECR 2 was published. So mm -hmm. I actually um, was just learning a new cataloging code there and applying it to languages for materials, you know, some of which I, I had some Spanish. I could get through those materials. And it had such a cosmopolitan uh, staff. I mean, our head of acquisitions was German. Um, uh, I had um, my immediate boss, Peter Enyingi, was Hungarian. There were probably three or four other Hungarians on the staff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, uh, you know, and, and later we had a, a, quite a few Asian because we were buying a lot of Asian materials. So we had mm -hmm. people in cataloging and acquisitions that um, you know, spoke the languages and things. So, um, it was a great training ground. Um, the, um, budgets of course for foreign materials were really deeply impacted because of the exchange rates and everything yeah. like that. Um, but we were still, you know, still buying a whole lot of material at that time and the early, early uh, to mid seventies. Um, and then every time I would start to send out a resume and start thinking about leaving somebody would leave and so I just got <laughs> kept getting promoted and then um you know in the late 80s became the assistant and uh, to technical services and mm -hmm. and that was a real advantage because um 
people like Forrest Drummond, who was the director when I started there, yeah. was a great proponent of AALL. And he really encouraged all the he, staff. He was a major shaker and player in yeah. our field in his era. Yeah, and, and Bill Stern was his... Uh, you know, the foreign and international. international. And yeah. Bill was gone like a year or so before I got there. Okay. And, um, but the foreign collection, I mean, that was Bill. Yeah. And that was his, you know, he had built that collection. I saw some letters, copies of things <laughs> of how he got, I don't know if I shouldn't say this, but he bought things from Europe and they came through Cuba to get there in the, you know, post-world war. They did war. what I guess had to be done to get this, build the collection. Yeah, and they had money to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so Forrest is there at, and he, every librarian in a professional position was immediately an AALL member. Mm -hmm. And um, that you know, was not universal in those days. No. And, no. Um, you know, so, and we had a very experienced reference staff, and, um, you know, it was they, and we were all encouraged to locally participate in SCAL as well. Uh -huh. And so um, I would say the biggest difference as, somebody starting off in the profession versus what I've since experienced in the academic area is that it, you were given permission to participate, but it usually had to be on your own time. Yeah. So anything I wrote, like how long you the literature, all those things were done post work hours. They were mm -hmm. not done up during work hours. So and, Forrest encouraged all this, but not quite as encouraged as he might have. That's right. <laughs> But, you know, they were pretty strict in terms of time. You had, yeah. you had a clock. You were on a clock. You were off at 4.30. And then, you know, you could do that kind of thing. Um, in fact, he was such a, you know, he was a former Navy guy. Yeah. And we actually operated on bells. We got a buzzer that, for the start of the break <laughs> in the morning and a buzzer at the end of breaks. And you had either first break or second break. And, um, sort of like the factory whistle, and, and some it was a tight, or, it was a tight ship yeah. that man ran. ran. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I can't think about. Uh, well, I used to joke to my husband when we were talking about. Well, what if I apply somewhere else? I'm okay, okay, where do I apply other than Berkeley, Harvard, Yale? You know what? To get a bigger collection, to which, get a, which were not exactly local to your husband's no. job. And but. you know, once you take the bar in a state where there's no reciprocity, like California, the, the, or the one I took it in. Yeah, <laughs> I know. So yeah, so that kind of said, okay, fine. I, there had to be a reason, and so um, I think the hardest thing was that, um, and and you know, Peter Eni was really my mentor in terms of participation in AALL and. Um, he was the head of tech services when I was on the board and as was a, a middle manager position, not having secretaries, not having other kinds of support. Peter was the one that made that possible because he was there and was willing for me to be able to make trips to Chicago for board meetings and mm -hmm. things like that. And so when somebody looks at, you know, well, why didn't she go on and do other, you know, after she was on the board? And I said, you know, after 1990, when Peter retired and I became the head of tech services, I didn't have the time to do some of the things I'd done that, before. That's when our group of board members from the 80s and later 80s would have come up perhaps to the next rung where they want you to do something, you know, yeah. And yeah. I was asked. Even and I, scarier. <laughs> and I just had to said, you know, I can't. I, I can't afford to do that. And yeah. I, I stayed active in AALL in, in doing things really related to tech services so mm -hmm. that it fit really with my job and, you know, and I could do that. So, yeah. um, and, you know, so that, that really was where I could continue my participation without necessarily being gone. And, yeah really even even being um, uh, a liaison from AALL, like to the ALA subject committee, that meant I was gone an extra day or so for ALA, and yeah. that was really hard. Uh, and that, um, so that really taught me that I, I, I really, in, in terms of where I was in my job, couldn't afford much, much more time. And so things that I could do in terms of writing or emailing or things like that I could do. Yeah. So. 
You know, it's interesting. You mentioned earlier there were a number of uh, Hungarians and other, perhaps other foreign people, and you mentioned Bill Stern, uh -huh. who also is from somewhere over German. Eastern, he was German. Eastern Europe yeah. or Europe, and they often some of these people came over during or after or thereabouts uh, World War II. And I know Forrest started there in about 1950 as the head of the library. Yeah, and coming from Some Chicago. Some of those mm -hmm. people from Europe itself? Yes. Um, and for instance, Peter um, fled Hungary uh -huh. and, um, and came to the U.S. and then went to library school and was at Cornell mm -hmm. and um, at you know, I don't remember Bill's background so much, but, um, you know, they um, they really, you know, gave up everything. They had no choice yeah, in many yeah. cases. Well, there were scholars and lawyers and such, uh, prominent ones in their own right. Yeah. And when they came here to the United States, one, they were not licensed to practice law, and two, in most states, if not all at that time, without citizenship, they couldn't yes. get the license. Yeah. So Peter Peter was a Hungarian. Yeah. Attorney. So they basically looked around, and some of them came into uh, our niche of the uh, right. uh, profession. There was a you know there was a vast number yeah. of, of of foreign trained lawyers yeah. that came in and were foreign and international. And like Peter became uh, head of tech services yeah. or, or collection development or you know many many mm -hmm. in, in that era of the yeah. post post World War. Well, Bill Stern, whom I knew, you know, he yeah. said he was gone before you, you got there, but uh, I knew him for the first few years because he, he his untimely death was not long after I had gotten to know him a little bit in, in meetings. Yeah. And he came home sick from AALL and yeah. never came back to work. That's I mean, right. Uh, you know. Yeah, he sort of had a breakdown, at the, mm -hmm. but he was a very, I think my term would be a highly strung guy, very, very goal-oriented a perfectionist, and that was a tough thing because uh, I think that was part of his what led the stresses. His, his, the stresses. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are aides at the county law library had to wear jackets and they got inspected, and yeah. actually, that, when he, that was another story I had heard that yeah, he when, actually enforced that. And mm -hmm. when he came down to cataloging and stuff, all the books had to be you know, lined up on your trucks with the spines out, and, you know, there were just, there were ways that you did things, and mm -hmm. that was the way they were done, yeah. so. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking your description of Forrest and his bells and management sort of a been, nautical they, theme, and yeah, they, Bill, uh, Bill Stern would be, that would, be, he'd be a good lieutenant. Uh, they worked well together. <laughs> or whatever yeah. level would yeah. be. Yeah. yeah, it was a great training ground. Yeah. In fact, we used to joke that County Law Library produced so many, many of the early firm librarians because we mm. they would work there and then they would go on to firm librarians yeah. and so um, yeah that was. Uh, let, let me ask you specifically. You've named a whole flock of people, some of whom were really very well known. Others probably mm -hmm. would have been if they'd been able to be more involved professionally. Mm -hmm. But do you have anybody that, uh, or maybe more than one, who you would consider a mentor in your mm -hmm. own? Career. Um, it would definitely be Peter and Yingyi. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure if I'm even saying or Yingyi, if I get the right Hungarian accent. Mm -hmm. um, because he was so involved in AEL now. He was um, so interested in subject analysis mm -hmm. of, of legal materials. And um, really, it was, um, he had been trying for years to get a cataloging manual via committee at AALL, and it, it just never got off the ground, right? And so I, uh, you know, I was doing all this analysis of how to apply AECR2, and it started mm -hmm. card files with examples and all this kind of stuff, and it just kind of fell together that, okay, fine, we have to deal with AECR2, let's write about it for cataloging legal literature. And, and at the time, Rhonda Lawrence, um, was in the department and she was a former English teacher. So mm -hmm. we had kind of our in-house editor and somebody for subject and somebody for description. So we did cataloging yeah, literature. The, uh, waterfront cover, it yeah, sounds that's like, right. as they say. So it was uh, an alignment of the stars that allowed us mm -hmm. to really put the first cataloging literature together. And mm -hmm. in fact, I was um, Sheila Jarrett, who still works for Hine, you know, was one of the people early on that I worked with at Rothman because she mm -hmm. was with 
um, Paul Rothman's company. So she made the transformation or the transition. Uh -huh. yeah. And she was in, involved when in... Hine became... Rothman became that's right. Hine. Yeah. That's right. She started working for, for Hine. Uh -huh. And that first edition, it's always fun to think back, it was produced on a peach tree PC, the first PC in the <laughs> library. And... You literally had one floppy for the RAM and one floppy to run the word processing mm -hmm. and one that you got your content on, right? Yeah. Unbelievable, you know, in, in terms of, of trying to produce a camera-ready piece of something yeah. for Hind to publish. Of course, it was rough in there. But, um, th and we had to actually give them camera-ready. So that was printing off a page and literally, my poor husband got roped into helping with scotch tape put the examples of the cataloging records in on the camera-ready copy. And this last edition that I did, we had a database at Hine remotely mm -hmm. that I was working in. I mean, the range of change. I mean, that must have been such a transformation in how you went about this work. Oh, my. And yet today, the, our current crop, you know, what this old stuff is. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so it, it was it was fabulous in terms yeah. of the difference in technology from one edition to the fourth, right? So yeah. So and and because of Peter, um, you know, get back to that mentoring, I mean he's the one that got me started writing and then he started the compilation of um, weekly lists of legal subject headings mm -hmm. and then when he retired I took that over. So it really, my whole publishing background is directly linked to him. So, if I can bring up another uh, often unmentioned topic about uh, our profession and partly that library, were you there when uh, Earl Borgeson came I was. as associate director of the first title? And I remember that. It's needless to say, it didn't last too long, but uh, rumor had it that. Uh, Forrest was perceived to be getting near retirement, mm -hmm. and Earl, having been the librarian for many years at Harvard, Harvard. and before mm -hmm. that as the university associate university librarian up at uh, Stanford, would be an ideal uh, heir apparent. And mm -hmm. uh, the only problem was they hadn't consulted with Forrest, who <laughs> 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 didn't feel, feel the need for an heir apparent, so Earl moved on to Southern Methodist, yes, where he had a yeah. final many good years on his career, yeah. you know, I said. It, it was, I think for me, the great advantage, not only working there with the people that I got to work with, like Earl, because he, he was there and I was yeah. there when he was there. He'd be very different, I Well, and Frank Hodak worked there, too, when Earl oh, was there. Oh, he's another laid-back type. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we were there, and I think the other great advantage for me at being in AALL and being on the executive board was that I got to experience other directors' styles mm -hmm. than just the ones that came through the county law library, yeah. right? And I really did break um, Earl's mold in the sense that he really recommended that anybody, any professional librarian move every two to three years mm -hmm. to... Ex not, not, not that he had done that in his own career, Not necessarily, <laughs> but he did really encourage that. And then, like you said, with a husband that had passed the California bar, uh, and I... And, I didn't have a whole lot of encouragement to to, to change yeah, locations. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, change locations. Plus, I was working in a county, so you know, I ended up being there thirty four years. So mm -hmm. um, that really was not the kind of professional track that Earl recommended. But um, the being in on the board with people like Margaret Leary and Albert Brecht yeah. and and Dick Danner. Um, yeah. The first strategic plan that ALL put together, you know, Dick was the one that did that. Yeah. Um, and I can remember being there when Roger Jacobs came back and was um, doing fiscal consulting with the board about how best to manage money and put it aside and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So um, for me, that was a, a great learning experience. Well, that was part of what built that reserve fund. That's right. That basically has helped them considerably over the years since. Yeah, yeah. its membership has declined and everything yeah. else. And yes, and so, um, you know, it was just as, um, you know, uh, 
a younger law librarian, you know, seeing that kind of model was, you know, just really the best experience. Mm -hmm. Alan Hollick, I mean, I just, you know, all the people I can name, Patrick Kiko, um, you know. Well, you were, got a few uh, dogs in the group. <laughs> <laughs> no, but also working with um, firm librarians yeah. because coming out Marilyn of Hearn was yeah, on the board and, and, and logging through there. Yeah, for and, a while. and I remember being on, well, we mentioned I was on a committee of committee with, um, we just talked about his, about it was Coco, Al Coco. Oh, Al Coco. Coco. Yeah. Um, you He'd know. be a style of leadership very different from, very say, different. Forrest Drummond's. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and, um, you know, it was, it was a, a very challenging time. I can remember, um, Richard Umelli, who became the director while I was on the board, he would see those board binders at those times, which would be, you oh, know, they're huge. were huge, yeah. you know, and so I'd have one of those in a, and a baby in a carry-all, and one of those on a plane, and he would go, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know, sometimes, but, uh, you know, it, it, it was, it, for me, it was well, really... executive director at the time, Bill Jepson, was, mm -hmm. that was his forte, organizing these meetings and stuff. And Have yeah. I ever told you my Bill Jepson story? No. I remember, um, you know, we we were talking some at some board meeting or whatever, and we were talking about, about planning and lining up the next cities, you know, because you always worked on them ahead oh, of time. Oh, yeah, you had to at least be about five years out for yeah, group our he, size to get the right place. And he would say he never had any trouble negotiating with hotels, because we were still in hotels at that yeah. point. And he would say, yeah, it's because, you know, Lolly brands drink as much, but don't do as much damage as the Legionnaires. Sorry. I remember that. <laughs> I hear exactly the same, maybe from the same source, but the hotels loved us. <laughs> Yeah, it's because we. Yeah. You know, well, we had all the publishers yeah. buying, um, you know, the libations, and yeah, and yet we were well behaved. We were yeah. a rowdy crowd that didn't do a lot of damage. So yeah. that was where that was my favorite Bill Jepsons, and I, yeah. you know, and I remind people, I, you know, at the time it was Bill Jepson and Babe, Babe Russo. So and yeah. you know, Babe managed all the SIS business, and you yeah. know, um, you know, we had. The SIS were just growing at that time, but, um, you know, we managed, because a lot of the time we also did a lot of the organizational stuff ourselves, too, you know, uh, in terms of... It was still before they had expanded the uh, headquarters, headquarters. Uh, personnel, mm -hmm. and a lot of that was to reflect the fact that so many of our people we wanted to ask to be leaders didn't have the commitments Resources. from their, from their uh, places, their employers, yeah. to... The resources needed to be part of that, so mm -hmm. this was to broaden the empowerment of who mm -hmm. could do this. But mm -hmm. There was a cost to it too. I mean, when we were all just doing it all ourselves, it was mm -hmm. different than it became later. Yeah, better so, or worse, I won't comment. But different. Well, I can make some comments, but I won't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, that's interesting. Now, something I wanted to ask you about because um, you were there. And, cataloging and tech services stuff and uh, LA County had its own version of Class K mm -hmm. partly because the Library of Congress was shall we say late in coming up with yes, that. there was version. no and because they, they, had, <laughs> they had so many foreign materials it was yeah. really crucial for them and it and and um, Drummond really bought, brought kind of the the seed of the classification from Chicago mm -hmm. And um, and because we the collection was growing so hugely, um, they started applying and built the foreign schedules, and you know it it really was the um, an essential part of the collection, and you know it it was for a long time the only totally classified law collection of its size in a single collection uh -huh. a classification. So um, yeah, and it um, in terms of you know, learning uh, the concept of classification really is is subject and topical based. So moving from one to the other was certainly not a challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's. Um, I know for a long time, some of us at least, I wasn't in the technical services end, mm -hmm. so I would hear these things, but I wasn't part of it. Or saying that you know, why should the Library of Congress even develop mm -hmm. Class K and its subclasses? Why not just take what was already there? It was good, and, and it worked. They met with LC 
no. stern and uh, you know there's there were records I don't know if they're still there about conversations some of it got into LLJ I believe but mm -hmm. about the conversations with Library of Congress and you know Berkeley was until the very end still much of the foreign collection was classed in, in LC and it was it was funny when I came here on campus somewhere along the line somebody at the main library was using county class for California not realizing that wasn't LC. <laughs> yeah. Well, it looked the same. <laughs> it was a K, right? Oops, yeah. oops, wrong call number. Um, so yeah, so there's they still have some classified early California it, it materials. Must, must have had some interesting uh, results when they tried to input it to our or L O C L C or one of them. And, you know, yeah, groups it's, like yeah. That. it's a, it was always supposed to be. Um, in, a, in a local field, like an 090 or something, so uh, people would not think it was an, an LC 050, but, you know, they didn't always see that and understand. Human nature being as it yeah. is, people didn't think of it, the little nuances. That's right, yeah. that's right. So that was one of the unique aspects about working in a collection that size that had its own classifications. Yeah. Well, it was an interesting era to be part of that, I'm quite sure. You had some mm -hmm. interesting people, some of whom I knew, many I don't know, mm -hmm. and, uh, but they sound like the kind of people I recognize, and the stereotypical uh, <laughs> librarians from, say, uh, Europe mm -hmm. after World War II. And, uh, it, was, it was interesting. Well, you left there in 2009 mm -hmm. and came here to the University of California's new law school that's at right. Irvine. That's uh, right. You want to talk about how all that came about and what that's meant to you and your... Um... Well, I, you know, I, I'd say rationale of why. Mm -hmm. Having Maybe worked... you love long commutes. I No, that was not... Even longer was... than you had before, no, no, I went was from, not short. <laughs> I went from 7 miles to 57 miles. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it had to be a real challenge to in order to make it worth my while to move. Yeah. And I had for years and years been um, essentially, I don't want to use the word demolishing, but dealing with declining budgets, you know, scaling back what we could get mm -hmm. for our money, closing branches. Um, you know, it was always pull back, pull back, pull back. And um, I had started tracking in 2007 or 8 when I started seeing notices about um, UC Irvine starting a law school and so you know I even wrote letters early on before they even posted any positions to let them know oh I'm closing a branch library if you need any books right so um, uh, I really you know wanted to keep on top of what was happening with with that and when they got Irwin to be Dean I mean you know, his reputation in terms of constitutional law was hard to resist. And then I knew that, um, well, Jessica Weimer, my current boss, and I talked, you know, off and on that there was a chance for this to, uh, to happen. And, it, and we kind of made an oral pact that, okay, if you go, I go, we'll jump, right? Because you had to have a lot of faith that it was going to happen. Yeah. Um, were we throwing away opportunities that we could use somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I could have just said, hey, okay, goodbye, I'm retiring. But <laughs> um, having dealt for so long with taking apart a collection, the thought of the challenge of building a collection at this time when, mm -hmm. you know, print, online, both, neither, I mean, you know, how do you make those decisions? Yeah. And um, and I hadn't worked in an academic library. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so there, I guess that would be probably typical of, of me in the sense that I was always looking for a challenge. Um, some of my staff at county used to say, no more beta testing. They would have it stamped on their head because I would jump to testing new integrated library system software or we let's classify all the branches or let's you know I was always interested in learning something and doing something mm -hmm. different so um and I had tried over the years to you know maybe go to one another academic library and it never happened and and this was 
okay, maybe now's the time. And so it worked out mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I made adjustments to be able to live with the commute and I kind of joked, um, with Erwin that, um, if I hadn't been here two nights a week trying to stay out of trouble, <laughs> um, I probably wouldn't have started a fourth edition of cataloging legal literature, but he was such a role model. I mean, he had two or three books every year that he was coming out with. And um, the 2009, for the first five years, I didn't have a spare minute. You know, I was working long hours, not counting doing some professional project. Um, Jessica and I started working here under furlough. So we. Yeah, she mentioned that in our conversation earlier this afternoon. So, yeah. I mean, were we crazy? I don't know. But anyway, so. <laughs> Furlough in the old days said so no income briefly. We essentially, we had no pay. We were not getting paid for five days. We we're getting paid for four. Yeah. And, you know, and, and we worked those days because we were starting a library, right? We had to do job descriptions, hire that, people. That was probably the plan from the top. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, so people, you know, so, well, so, you know, people, I was getting encouraged by people like Sheila at home. I said, when are you going to do a new edition? When are you going to do a new edition? And I'm saying, well, I've been doing collection development for the last five years just to keep my head above water, right? I don't have time to do that, but... Finally, the stars aligned, and uh, AALL uh, members like John Hostage and George um, and um, Melissa Beck and whatever had worked on getting RDA kind of fixed up mm -hmm. after it started, and so that really led to me looking at maybe doing another edition, and um, Melissa Beck at UCLA agreed to, to work with me, and... Um, and so then after working long, long hours on the collection for the first five, then we did the book, which was those hours. And so then my current project to keep me doing two jobs at the same time is um, mm -hmm. camp least. <laughs> campus is doing a migration uh, wow. to a new library, integrated library system. Mm -hmm. And so I'm on the implementation team. So... Oh my gosh, the list of things that we have to do in terms of training and data testing and migration and, um, you know, and that's, and keep the faculty happy at the same time. Yeah. Um, that's, it's been a pretty interesting time the last six months working on that. So. I'll bet. Well, getting back to the book, that's the uh, um, Cataloging Legal Literature, a manual on AACR2 and the Library of Congress subject headings for legal materials is the exact title. That was the first edition, yes. Yeah. That was the uh, number 22 of the AAL publication series. That's right. And the new one is, um, fourth edition is being was published about two years ago in mm -hmm. 2016. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're talking now in 2018. That's right. And um, one of the things that is very different about the fourth edition, not only I mentioned about how we created it, mm -hmm. that I, you know, I'm online in a database on Heinz server, you know, uh, creating this data. Yeah. Um, it, we included classification this time, so we added a chapter on classification because we could not, in that first edition, neither Peter and I were using county class K. Yeah. We couldn't. Oh, well, was 30 years ago, we, and times have sort of changed. Yeah, we couldn't purport to be experts in LC classification. We weren't using it, right? Yeah. And I still am not an expert in LC classification, but, um, you know, it, at least was something that we had to touch on and, and, and give some guidance because the other AALL publication um, went on classification that um, Marie Whitehead and who else? No, I'm trying to remember who, who did that manual. Um, it hadn't been done since. It was really uh, telling people why to use Class K. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how, K, LC's Class K because so many law libraries weren't classified at all. Yeah. A lot of them had patterns like the like Yale 6 system That's right. where they would put all the treatises under the T for treatise, yeah. and then there'd be a cutter number that would give them each a unique uh, address. Yeah. Or Harvard's system, which was, you know, different in that they 
grouped them in groups so the whole bunch of the books had the same exact dress or call number, <laughs> and you had to sort of hunt around and hope you found what you wanted yeah. somewhere in the group. That's right. So learning, um, at least trying to come up with how to address classification was the challenge for the fourth edition, yeah. dealing with the production methods that we have now and and it being online. Um, uh, it, it really made a, a, you know, a real difference in terms of how we keep it up to date. So Melissa and I just did the third revision already for that, that 2016 publication. And, um, you know, we're already thinking about the next version. And what we want to try and do is really make sure even part one, which was still done basically in, in Word, somehow gets into a database so we can keep the whole thing as easily updated as our part two so you're is. you're not anticipating that your uh, grandchildren's uh, generation will do the next edition? <laughs> like, if you space it out like you did the first two? <laughs> no, 20 years between the third and the fourth. No, people always say, what were you doing? And I say, well, <laughs> if you look at the preface of the third edition in 1997, I said in there, a ALA is working on an AACR3. Yeah. I said, and, and I'm, a, I'm kind of in a place where I don't know what to do about a next edition because I may have a new code to deal with. Well, that didn't happen because they scrapped AACR3 and went to RDA and then whatever. And then I said, and I also raised two kids, um, <laughs> you know, because... Uh, laptops weren't really that in in the, those days, and I spent a lot of time on soccer fields, baseball fields, uh, you know, and watching games. The typical and, uh, parent yes. sort of activities. Well, yeah, I wonder so, why. <laughs> yeah. So um, the the book kind of went on back burner because of all those things, and then, like I said, I I knew I wanted to do when RDA was out that we needed to do another one, but. Um, I was too busy building a collection, um, so. Well, you know, you've done a lot in addition to just being too busy building a collection because, you know, you've already talked about the fact that you were on the AAL executive board. You've done some other work, institutes and stuff for ALL. Mm -hmm. And I uh, want to mention, since it's probably more appropriate that I mention it than you do, uh, <laughs> that you have been acknowledged for your work in, in our profession in formal, proper ways. You have the Rene D. Chapman Memorial Award for Outstanding Contributions to Technical Services Law Librarianship, which you got back in 1996. So you know, mm -hmm. by then you were well established and known. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got that from the uh, AEL Technical Services Special Interest Section specifically. And I am pleased to mention that you joined the, uh, as an inductee, uh, the AELL Hall of Fame uh, just last year. That's right. Uh, and rightly so, in my opinion. Well, thank you. My humble and unqualified opinion. Hey, we work together, Patrick, right? <laughs> well, yes, that's my, <laughs> my humble and unqualified opinion. No, technically, it was, it was a great experience, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very pleased that uh, you even accorded those recognitions because they're, you know, they may only be a little piece of paper on your wall, but it means a lot, too. It does. I think it's especially for me because for tech services that I had, had spent so much of my later professional activities with groups just working on things like changes to cataloging codes and things. But, um, you know, when you list those and you look at all the time and things that that were involved with it, it was mm -hmm. it was a, a great honor to to um, to get the. A Hall of Fame award, and um, and and today even the people I think in terms of nomination or, or people who wrote letters or whatever, those are people that I participated with on mm -hmm. on activities in AALL that were broadened my experience of working with the association. Yeah. So um, it's very competitive. Uh, I had a small role in the nomination process again this past year for or this year for, for somebody the who will be getting uh, one of the you know the hall of fame but since it's still embargoed information i can't talk <laughs> any further about that <laughs> <laughs> well 
Well, I guess I'll have to wait to right before ALL when the awards are announced. Well, they right? announce it somewhere around. Uh, yeah, it's pretty soon. Uh, around the first part of June, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, the especially season. if they want people to plan to be at yeah. ALL. And I've heard rumors of a few of the other uh, people who are going to be recognized, and I think highly of everyone up okay. that I've heard anything about. Now, again, I better not divulge any of this. One, it's embargoed, and two, I could be wrong. <laughs> That's all. Of them. That's right. And that would be embarrassing. I'd have to re-edit this thing after I find <laughs> out. <laughs> if it wasn't who you who you anticipated that exactly. was getting the award. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> now, I had a, I, it was really fun, and the, and the group that I was sitting with at lunch for the uh, the award, yeah. um, they even surprised me by Rhonda Lawrence, who had retired, came to the. Um, the luncheon there and whatever and was at ALL and hadn't been in several years so that was that was fun to have her there um, well that's one of the advantages of some of the recognitions people do come back to receive theirs uh -huh. and, and, and yeah. it's nice until they look around and discover as I have when I've gone back after a few years not you don't who know do them. I know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where is no I don't see anybody. Yeah thankfully my husband knows quite a few of the Southern California group and so mm -hmm. he's joined me, Mike's joined me at, so, at, at association. So he's part of your network. Yeah. That's great. And, and um, you know, I always, like you say, there are people like Carol Billings and her husband, right, yeah. that you yeah. see there. And I've known so many of the vendors like Hine and things mm -hmm. for a long, long time. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, um, Michael St. Ange, I met him when he was in a law firm, and he was, and we were on like a committee on committees, I think the second time I was on a committee on committees, and um, he was at firms, and then he worked for Lexus, and now he's back in a firm, right, and it's been fun to just see people that you met in new and other venues that, you know, circle around within the profession, so... Um, well, it has been a wonderful organization from my perspective because we did get to know each other. And I know it got bigger for a while, now it's gotten a little bit smaller, but I think that openness to be friendly with each other has been a characteristic that uh, time and again I've, I've heard about and, and seen. Well, and so so willing to share what they learn. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, when I came here with nothing, I mean, we, we had to set up library system. I'd never worked with faculty before. I mean, I knew people I could call, right? And, you know, people at FC, Diana Jacques was so helpful thinking about how to set up fund structures for dealing with, um, um, you know, uh, fund accounting because I'd never had to do an ABA report before. And what did that mean? <laughs> and, um, you know, so um, I think maybe I was always more willing to jump into new areas because I had people I could ask, right? Um, well, and keep these people in mind because every year they have a nominating process for some of these recognitions, yeah. and there might be some folks in that group that <laughs> very much ought to be included in those recognitions. Yes. And yeah. you know, you can become a <laughs> person that helps bring that about, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I you know that's I think it's one of those. Things that's very hard sometimes to make clear to people that um, in a volunteer group, um, you know, if you say yes and you do what you say <laughs> you will do and you do it in a timely fashion, you will get asked to do other things. Oh, how did you guess? <laughs> <laughs> and you have to learn to say no sometimes, but yeah. that, that being, doing what you say you will do. And, and I, it kind of bugged me a long time, but I've gotten over it. Sometimes people will say they will do something in a volunteer association just so they can get it on their review yeah. sheet, right, for yeah. academic purposes. And, um, uh, but people learn that, right? And, and so it's if you do what you say you're going to do and you do it well, then you, yeah. you get asked so to do other things. The word does sort of get around about who the deadbeats are. Yeah. Right? Maybe I'll put you edit that part out. But no, I won't. I'll leave it in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is the nature of a, a volunteers yeah. um, group. And, I, and being small and everyone sort of knowing each other. Yeah. Um, my husband's very active in the Tournament of Roses for, in Pasadena. Oh. So mm -hmm. that's another volunteers a, a group that, you know, sometimes it uh, drives him nuts because people don't do what they say they're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. But that's kind of the nature of a volunteer group. And, um, you know, um, 
I, I, I always joke him, it's a good thing he's retired because the number of hours he's put in the last three years, wow, <laughs> he, he could not have done it. But, well, it's a spectacular parade they yeah, put on, I, and they, we see it on TV. So. Yeah, he's on float entries, which is really, it's the group that literally works with the people who are using it as an advertising venue and making choices about float design and yeah. floats and, and everything else. So it's a, it's been a fascinating process to see that happen. And it, and being in Pasadena is one of the reasons I put up with a 57 mile commute because mm -hmm. um, we want to retire there. And um, you know, at the same time, I, I love the challenge of doing this. So yeah. yeah. Well, as you say, you've learned how to accommodate it, live with it now for mm -hmm. a number of years. So, uh, you know, that's that. Right. Uh, yeah, and driving the freeway late at night last night, my son and I had been you know, out uh, east of town and we mm -hmm. had come in and the GPS had taken us out there in the morning during, you know, when everyone else was on the road through a roundabout group of uh, freeways in the, on the edges of the metro. And we decided we're going to challenge it and go right on in on I-5. The old one goes right through town. And yeah. we did, no problem at all. But this was 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. I often on Thursday nights drive home at 8. <laughs> that's yeah. when I leave. And, uh, well, you know. that's one way to cope with mm -hmm. commutes. And given the number of people probably on that freeway at 8 o'clock, if we'd come in a little earlier, we might have been better to follow the GPS around town. Well, that's why I... Kind of say to people there you make decisions in your career that i would never have accepted a commute like this when i had small children at home yeah. right but um it it wouldn't have been possible but mm -hmm. um given where i was uh, you know in terms of my career that it it was a possibility and and um you know uh, it sometimes i think my life has been a lot of just opportunity yeah. right that I never would have gotten to county if it hadn't, I hadn't sent an unsolicited resume. I wouldn't have written a book if my husband hadn't been a practice, practicing lawyer with long hours. So, you know, I did it to mm -hmm. stay out of trouble. Yeah, <laughs> and I even, yeah so um, anyway, so there have, have been opportunities like that uh, throughout my whole career. Well, I do recommend, uh, Melody, that when the time is right, you decided this retirement is in the win for me and I'm doing it. Uh, <laughs> you and your husband hopefully will be able to do some traveling or whatever strikes your fancy. Uh, well, and you know, I mentioned those AALL babies. Well, you know, I, people who have worked with me a long time will get a little hysterical when they think that AJ is 31. And yeah, <laughs> they and do he, grow up. <laughs> yeah, and he's engaged and he, he and his fiance are living in Scottsdale. And, yeah. He works for Subaru, and then my youngest um, lives in Santa Monica and ha has a girlfriend. Um, and <laughs> that child um, works for Riot Games. He's a video capture artist, mm -hmm. and totally ruined my mother mantra of get off that PC gaming. You can't make a living doing that, right? <laughs> oh, that's just fine. <laughs> <laughs> and he is, right? So. Um, it's it's interesting how how some of these things uh, change and evolve. That yeah, yeah, she has a he's making a living gaming. But yeah. um, well, I sort of can appreciate that. I have uh, in editing these videos. I have for about the last six years used a what was then a fairly fast high end computer because this video editing it requires a lot of uh, power. You know, uh -huh. and speed. yeah, images. Yes. Yeah. And I had to replace it and a few weeks ago and uh, did. And I have one of these that's for gaming because uh -huh. they said, the, the people that advised me said that the same needs. Graphic both, cards yeah. and, and mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing. And the new one is faster and, you know, as I would expect and fancier, but, um, you know, and it does the job. The most powerful PCs are the gaming PCs. In yeah. fact, you know, um, it, innovative campus that it is, the UCI was like the first public institution with a scholarships for um, eSports. So the, mm -hmm. the League of Legends, the gaming uh, company, uh, the game that my son's company works for, is one of the um, team participatory sports that mm -hmm. UCI has as an eSport. 
And so, you know, no, they don't have a football team, but they have an esports team. <laughs> <laughs> you probably never thought when he was about 14 and you were trying to get him to work on his schoolwork and not play games on the computer that uh, he was really uh, playing games, preparing for the future right, a lot more effectively right. perhaps than you had thought. That's right. I mean, uh, even though um, you know, what he's doing is, is a video piece of promoting the games, I mean, mm -hmm. they only hire people who are gamers because exactly. they understand. They have to know what it is they're explaining. That's right. <laughs> they understand uh, the, the, the game and to be able to promote it for other people. So, yeah. um, you know, and it's, it's fairly interesting having been a, uh, a communication radio TV film. It, here's a child that actually seems to have an interest and may be able to make a living at it. So I, you know, so it's 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 very. So the gaming industry, computer gaming, is driving a lot of things in our technology. Uh, when I first started doing videos, and I would send them to the Hein Company to oh. go on Hein Online, uh, you know, an hour-long video uh, would perhaps take uh, two, three hours to go up uh, through the cable modem, uploading to their uh, mm -hmm. servers or Dropbox actually is where mm -hmm. we park them in the mm -hmm. interim. And now, 10, 15 minutes yes, at the right. most, I have, well, the upload speed is still sort of slow by comparison to the download speed, but I have uh, half a gig now at home. And, uh, you know, who would have thought that? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Even a year ago. Yeah, it's been it's been very interesting yeah. in how the, the, well, even talking about electronics, uh, digital, you know, the whole concept of what is a law library in the 21st century, yeah. um, you know, um, supporting that, you know, say, well, you're going to have how many simultaneous users of this ebook, yeah. right? Um, you know, how many people are going to download this? Yeah. It's um, all got to be factored. Yeah, I mean. And the and, gaming industry is the model that often is used to try and figure all this stuff out, and it's what drives some of the capacity, yeah, especially the, to the home market. Yeah, uh, streaming and this kind of thing so yeah. um you know it's it it's very interesting times but then i i kind of think of of my grandfather's life he went from horse and buggy to man on the moon right so exactly think of the changes in his life uh, yeah so i guess it's it, you know ch and i think change for for libraries in general um mm -hmm. has always been the name of the game since i've been in it yeah. and um you know and that ability, flexibility, dealing with change, um, for me, has been one of the important hiring um, personality, if you will, that I'm looking for traits in, in people because it has been nothing but change. Well, you know, those who preceded my generation, I'm just a tad farther ahead of you, but not by much. I remember thinking back when we were going through Lexus coming in and Westlaw and then some of the other stuff, mm -hmm. some of which has come and gone, some of which has gone on to really fun, even better things today for us. Um, thinking back, those people came into the profession and, gra and ended up retiring from it. It hadn't changed that much for many of them. Their libraries were still mostly books. They maybe were now cataloged and they hadn't been, which was a big change. But aside from that, things hadn't changed. And then the changes started. And, um, you know, my, my cohort was going through all those. And, and those who followed me, even more so, yeah. including yourself, I mean, at this point, because you're still active. And, and, I, and I think, though, one thing when we talk about change, that that a lot of what I'm still doing is still based on what I learned in those early those early mm -hmm. years, and one of those was that as much as things change, certain things are still the same. And yeah. you know, uh, we still use pencils and pens. Um, will we ever not have books? I think we'll always have some print, because it the human factor is the one that determines how that information mm -hmm. is used and. They, they've done research showing that law students don't comprehend as much and retain it if they're keyboarding versus hand notes, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, yes, we there are real advantages to a digital collection. There are still, for the human factor, still real issues in, yeah. in that um, absorbing that information. So I don't, I don't think that we'll ever not have print. And I always joke that law libraries started dealing with loose leaves in the 40s and the 
the rest of the world caught up with the internet because an integrating resource is a loose leaf and a website, right? Exactly. It's all right there in one That's sequence. Right. That's right. That's right. And, and it's current. That's right. <laughs> or as current as it could be. Yeah. And so that, I think, I have a real advantage sometimes when trying to train people and write about cataloging this because I do know what transfer binders and loose leafs and all this kind yeah. of thing really are and how that translates to an electronic resource, right? And yeah. so... Yeah, it, 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 I think you never, you never have something that doesn't some have some application to yeah. the current. Yeah. Well, as you say, when you're hiring people, you want somebody who's willing to be, my terms, adventuresome enough to mm -hmm. dream a That's little right. bit about what could be. Yeah, I'm, I've been very, it's been very pleasing for me that um, you know, we're a department of five, which mm -hmm. is pretty small for collection services. Yeah. But, um, you know, they, we've all been trooping over to this ALMA training, right? And, um, you know, they'll turn and look at each other. Okay, fine, we do that now. This is what we're going to do next. I mean, they're, they're analyzing it and, yeah. and thinking about how they're going to do their jobs differently instead of trying to figure out, well, I always did it this way. I want to keep doing it this way. And, yeah. um, you know, I've been really thrilled um, with, the way that they're approaching this whole migration and and um, you know and dealing with that and I must tell you that when I came I did hire two staff away from county so two of my five people so you've poached a little bit from <laughs> two, the old folks yeah two of my Christopher um, Thomas and Lillian Brasilero came yeah I got them here well, shortly I hope after. you didn't drag them into a fifty-seven mile commute <laughs> not quite they were they were more East Bay a little better than me than Pasadena so. Uh, Lillian's still, yeah, Christopher's in a carpool, but, um, and one of, you know, I, I just said to people, you know, one, I didn't have time to train. I was trained to get stuff started. I mm -hmm. couldn't train somebody to catalog legal, legal literature. I had to have somebody that knew what they were doing. So, um, you know, that was my rationale in terms of, of trying to hire them. Um, and, uh, um, you know, Lillian had, did foreign and continuations it, County, so I, and I knew that um, the piece about copy cataloging she could learn. So mm -hmm. anyway, so yes, that made the transition to a new job a little easier because I brought people with me that I knew could deal with some of the challenges. Tried, and, true, and you knew exactly what you were getting. Yeah, at. and they could, very and, prudent, <laughs> and they could deal with the change we would face. Right. So um, anyway, so yeah, I I, yeah. I do have that advantage and. And, and my other two employees, Diane Dunn and Laura Filotti, um, you know, uh, have learned so much in, in the times they've been here. And um, mm -hmm. two years ago, we had um, campus went with a brand new financial system. And so, um, you know, they've had to learn how to use that as well. So, you know, it, it's Part seems of like the every way it is. Every days. time you turn around, there's yeah. something that's different. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe on that basis, uh, Melody, we're getting probably nearing the end of our conversation this afternoon. But before we do, is there anything that we've not talked about that uh, you would like to uh, mention? I always like to give someone the opportunity because uh, some of them do have things. Well, I would say that maybe the one of the hardest things for me in terms of having been active in AALO for so long was that I have seen kind of what I, I guess I view as maybe less support for tech services from mm -hmm. the association. And we've seen it in places like um, withdrawal of funds for support of um, liaisons to ALA. And oh. those were super important when we were doing new legal rules in, in RDA and um, creation of legal genre headings and the amount of time that those, those representatives put in to making that happen for the good of law librarians, right? And, um, you know, I've, we've seen, I think, in general, that what's happening is that while staffs may have gotten smaller because of print reduction mm -hmm. in law libraries, what's happened is, which has been the case since I've been in the profession, is that the technical capabilities of the people that you have to hire are higher, mm -hmm. right? We had a huge typing pool when I started at County because we were typing cards, right? Yeah. So, um and now I need people who can deal with systems and, you know, 
finance codes in, you know, all this kind of stuff. So, and I don't know of an electronic resource that I have acquired that was easier than putting a book on the shelf. I mean, every one of them is a challenge. And so, and the amount of time we still have to spend on invoicing and things like that is even greater. So I, I, I really felt, I think, the impact of what AALL has not been able to provide to tech services for support as a real loss in terms of where I think we were 30 years ago. Um, and so for me, I think that's one of my real issues right now is I've, I've, I've tried to express that one at, at every opportunity that I've had of how important I think it is to the association that they continue to support the whole profession. Um, and I'm, I'm happy we have another technical services person on the board this year, Barbara well, Sullivan. Well, that's sort of my thinking of what where the solution to your needs could become. Would be more people coming on the board who have that appreciation. Barbara Seldon is on the yeah. executive board now. And There's many uh, who come up through public services, as many directors do, who often end up in disproportionately large numbers of leadership mm -hmm. roles mm -hmm. in the profession. I mean, yeah. I was part of that too. Uh, yeah. We are a little bit blind to some of the realities of the, uh, the back office end of the operation. Yeah. And, um, you know, so it, it, it's, a, again, a challenging time in, in it. And I'm, I think that, you know, it's hopefully going to cycle back up again, right? Um, yeah. it, when I look at the job postings, the number of jobs in Southern California alone, I mean, there's so many opportunities here. I really hope that the association is going to remain the training ground for the people that we need to mm -hmm. fill those positions. Yeah. Right. And well, so. as you say, people are looking for interesting opportunities for careers, and you've just named one that might well be that kind of a and, career. And, and people always say, well, why would you go to law librarianship? And, and I always go, to me, um, especially on the tech services side, it has more challenges, I think, than maybe other than maybe the art people. Um, in terms of the data that we have to create, maintain, um, and make available to, for me, always my first patron, which is my reference staff, right? Because if they can't find the stuff, they can't help the faculty, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, having the skills that we need to support that faculty are really crucial. Um, so, you know, that, if I, that's my contribution to, you know, what I haven't talked about in, in the change I see in terms of, for the profession, yeah. a real crucial time. Well, you know, it's interesting as a person with the law degree as well as the library degree, I used to hear why I wasn't, you know, basically why aren't you a lawyer in a, the full traditional sense, practicing mm -hmm. law. And yet librarians, I suppose, are reacting to the same kind of thing. If you do what I do, you're doing the right thing. If you're doing something else, in other words, if you, I'm a librarian in a general library and you are a specialty librarian mm -hmm. like a law library, there's got to be something lesser about that if human nature thinks that way. Um, and yet what you're describing is that it is probably not at all the case. And, no. uh, and these opportunities are here. and. Some of the more interesting aspects of it might be in, in our niche of the general library profession. And, um, you know, we have every all the challenges that the main library has in terms of electronic resources mm -hmm. and licensing. We have even more because yeah. they have big providers of data, which in so many cases the law is behind. Mm -hmm. I, I remember campaigning for years to get EDI invoicing through Thomson Reuters West. Oh. But, you know, it still hasn't happened, right? Well, We're they probably have their own system and it works know. for them. That's right. Think. So, <laughs> yeah, I, and and staff have to understand legal literature. So, yeah. I, you know, it to me it is the most challenging yeah. environment to be working in. Yeah. So, um, I guess I have a little bias, but... <laughs> well, it's the old, if you're not doing what I'm doing, you're doing something lesser <laughs> syndrome, uh, working in the other way direction. But in our case, we're correct. Aren't we? Yes, we are. <laughs> well, maybe on that, uh, before we get ourselves into more trouble. trouble. <laughs> yes. 
Melody uh, Lindkey, I want to thank you for taking uh, time this afternoon, not only to have me here to talk to you on camera, but also you've had a lot to roll in helping set this thing up and uh, so that I could come and uh, be here at the university and um, see you and, and your, your associate dean, director, person. Uh, and uh, it's been a wonderful afternoon, and I appreciate that as much. As I can. Well, thank you. Yeah, but in thanking you, I also I get to come, so I, sh I sh shouldn't thank you at all for me because I had so much fun. <laughs> but I want to thank you also on behalf of Michelle Wu, uh, Frank Kodak, and uh, Nick Spinelli, our colleagues with whom I've had the privilege of working for the last few years to on put together project. our oral history. And, yeah. uh, well, f well, Frank has always been for me the AALL historian, right? So, well, that was part of why he got involved in this project. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite right. sure. In yeah. fact, just as an aside to you, I asked Frank to do some research for me because I was curious. Mm -hmm. Because when I went on the board in '87, I said, "Who was the my preceder, pre whatever the person who came before me from Tech Services?" Myra Pimsler was the way back. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that it started a wave then with Marky Axman and Carol Nicholson yeah. and, you know, whatever. So, um, anyway, that, that was kind of an interesting thing in terms of the, again, the up and down in yeah. terms of participation. The, the sort of the cycle and then it mm -hmm. sort of repeats down. and down yeah, and up yeah. and, yeah, that, that's interesting. Well, I'm glad, Patrick, you made the time. All right. Um, well, it's been I've my pleasure. I, I thoroughly I, enjoyed it. As some people know, I travel to do these, and that's mm -hmm. that's an awful lot of fun. I'm glad too. to give you the opportunity to go to the Grand Canyon, you know. And well, do so we had uh, <laughs> in a couple of days. Uh, yes, and yeah. visit with Dick Spinelli, and a you know, nap tonight. <laughs> yes, so um, you know, and Dick Dick is a very good friend. In fact, uh, he he knows the orange propensity, and I got a. a picture of a orange stove once for him that he thought I had to have in my kitchen. I don't have it yet, but... <laughs> I don't believe I've seen that version of the showrooms. <laughs> he probably They're all has... white and stainless steel these Yeah, days. I think it was a French, some black, French enameled version or something yeah. that he saw in a showroom and, and thought of me, so... Um, you know, well, that, everything in its era and, and cycle, and maybe uh, we'll all be buying orange stoves one of these days. No, I doubt it. But um, <laughs> it, when you see orange from now on, you'll think of me, Patrick. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll also think of a, another interview I did about two years ago at uh, Cornell. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the background, because their color is mm -hmm. orange, we had a you know, place where they have interviews done on mm -hmm. campus, and we used it in, uh, for Penny's uh, interview. And it's all orange behind <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's too bad I didn't have that for a background, but uh, we have a lot still of green in this oh, collection. Oh, we had it for a background. We might have trouble seeing you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I wouldn't stand out, right? Yeah. But... Well, I can mess up colors a bit in editing, though, <laughs> but I better no. not. <laughs> no, you better not. In fact, um, if Fun story, when we saw the first cut of the, the demo of Cataloging Legal Literature that Hine had at the booth mm -hmm. in, in 2016 at the AALO, it was kind of maroon covered. And Melissa Beck, my co-author, talked to Hine and they changed it to orange for me. So, uh, so they, they cleaned up their act. That's right. So bless Hine. Yes, they, they followed through on all that. So, um, But anyway, to me, that's part of the fun relationship of the association, right? Well, you know, I, I suppose I can be criticized for pushing Hein at this point since they're our, our sponsor here of the uh, series. Um, but they are as much like the old days in terms of the right sense of that, of being really part of our group, uh, mm -hmm. of any of the publishers I suspect today are, That's can right. be. That's right. I, and I and there, are, there are benefits to that, too. Uh, and their support of the, of the profession, um, you know, in terms of publishing cataloging tools. Yeah. I mean, yeah. who else would do that, right? Because yeah, as, my, market. as my husband said, you know, if I'd spent half as much time on a romance, I might have made some money. Um, <laughs> but um, you don't do it for that. You do it yeah. for the profession. And it's a necessary addition to have this literature, mm -hmm. so knowledge-based. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. You're welcome. It's been fun.